Well, this hot streak that we've seen in the U.S. markets is getting fueled courtesy of some weaker than expected economic data, particularly on the job front. That's filtering into rate expectations. Speculation the Federal Reserve is nearing the end of its rate hiking cycle or that we're already at the end. Our next guest says now's a good time to sell and lock in profits on some of the high flyers. For more, we're joined by Dave Sakira, Chief U.S. Market Strategist at Morningstar. Dave, thanks so much for being with us. When you're talking the high flyers, are you talking about, you know, this band of Magnificent Seven that have done a lot of the work so far this year? Well, a couple of the Magnificent Seven, in our view, have moved up a little bit too much at this point in time. I and mean, we do think that they've gotten into overvalued territory. Yeah, Apple would be one that we think has moved up, you know, much higher than our fair value. But there's a couple of others. You know, Tesla would be one where I think that's moved up too much, you know, thus far this year. You know, it started in undervalued territory. You know, same thing with Netflix. That's another one that's moved up too much. And then there's a couple that we just think, you know, have been overvalued all year that we're still concerned about. You know, Oracle, Lilly would be two others that I'm concerned are overvalued. And we do think now's a good time to lock in some profits there and move into some of those other you know, undervalued stocks that have you know, lagged the market. Why is now a good time? Well, you know, we're also here in the end of August. You know, things are certainly quieting down. So I think it provides you know, investors the opportunity really to take a good, fresh look at their portfolio, you know, make sure that they're confident in those that they have, you know, on their on their books right now and also, you know, have the time to do some due diligence and some new opportunities. It's interesting when you look at undervalued sectors, what screens mm -hmm. to you as the most undervalued right now? Well, we use a number of different screens. You know, the first one that I would highlight is just using a pure bottoms up analysis, you know, looking for those companies that we think are high quality, you know, specifically those that we rate with either a narrow or a wide economic moat. Where an economic moat, I mean, that's just really a Warren Buffett, Graham and Dodd esque type analysis, looking for those companies that have, you know, long term or durable competitive advantages that will allow those companies to generate excess returns, you know, and find those that are trading at pretty deep discounts to our intrinsic valuation. But I also like looking for, you know, those stocks that are tied to or levered to long term secular trends. You know, a couple of those trends being electrification, med tech, infrastructure and, of course, AI. Is there a name within sort of the love tech sector that you think could still fall under the undervalued category? You know, there's a couple in tech. So overall, you know, tech, we do think as a sector is starting to get to be slightly overvalued. But a couple there that I would highlight would be Uber. You know, we still think that mm. there's going to be you know, good demand for Uber going forward. You know, we're seeing an increase both in the number of rides, the number of rides per user. Uh, I do like Checkpoint software. Uh, we do think there's good long term secular demand you know, in the cybersecurity area. And Autodesk, which I think is going to do well, you know, that's going to be tied to, you know, long term demand and infrastructure. We saw an upgrade of the telcos uh, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier this week. AT&T, Verizon, those have gotten beaten up. And I'm curious how mm -hmm. you're looking at those companies because people stay away from them, you know, even though they've got this high dividend yield, just thinking, you know, the balance yep. sheets look challenged. Yeah, so with those two, those are actually two of our higher conviction you know, picks yeah. right now. Both of them are rated five stars. Uh, they traded about a 40% discount to our long-term intrinsic valuation. As you mentioned, you know, high dividend yields, I think they're about 7%. So I think what happened here you know, in the short term, the market's overestimating the environmental liability that they could face from lead in their cable sheathing. But really, I think the big differential in our view here is our long-term thesis. And having talked to our equity analysts there, you know, I know that he thinks that you know, following a lot of merger within that sector, you know, we do think that it's going to start operating more like an oligopoly. So thinking about that, you know, he's not going to look for as much you know, competition on prices going forward as what we've seen in the past. And that, of course, will then drive you know, higher margins for both of those companies. When I think about unloved, telcos definitely fall in that category, mm -hmm. but so too does real estate, uh, commercial real estate mm -hmm. uh, being kind of a, a bad word these days. How willing are you to take that unloved thesis out to that sector? <laughs> 
<laughs> so, you know, office space, I certainly would steer clear of. You know, I do think that there's still a lot of potential for downward valuation you know, within that area. But across the real estate sector, we do see a lot of opportunities. You know, in this case, the office space has really pulled down real estate valuations just across the board. Uh, two specific areas that I do like, you know, in real estate right now are going to be, you know, in the boutique hotel space. Mm. So we are seeing a pickup in, you know, international travel, travel coming specifically from Asia and from China. So some of the higher end hotels, like a park hotels, is one that we think will benefit from that. But we also like the malls. You know, Class A malls are seeing you know, a return in foot traffic, consumers going back into you know, in-person shopping. You know, Simon Property Group would be the one that I would highlight there. Um, I'm curious what you think about the energy sector, because on one hand, mm -hmm. it has run up. On the other, uh, you know, when you look at the valuations, particularly you know, on a group mm -hmm. of Canadian ones, um, it still looks pretty cheap. Well, energy is one of these ones, like over the past couple of years, it's really acted like a pendulum. You know, in the pandemic, it went, you know, way too far to the downside. You know, 2021, 2022, huge returns in the energy sector. But we think at this point it's run up, you know, too far. And when I look at oil prices, we do think that they're going to remain high here in the short term. But over the long term, we do forecast oil prices will decline. You know, specifically, you know, over the rest of this decade, we think demand probably in the later years will start to decrease. You know, some of the things like electrification will you know, lead to lower demand. You know, we do expect the auto production will continue to shift to electric vehicles. So our long-term forecast for oil is you know, $55 a barrel for 55? West Texas and 60, 55. That is where we see uh, the marginal supply and demand you know, equaling you know, over time and uh, $60 for, bear, for Brent. I mean, OPEC's not going to allow that. <laughs> well, you know, OPEC is going to try and certainly keep prices as high as they can, you know, as long as they can. But again, when you start thinking about, you know, EVs, you know, we think that by 2030, two thirds of all global new auto production will be electrified, whether that's a battery electric or a hybrid. You know, plus we also demand, expect to see a you know, demand decrease in several other different areas. Plus, we also expect that over time, you know, these high oil prices now will certainly bring you know, new production coming online, you know, even within the United States here and you know maybe some of those uh, shale oil companies up in Canada. So, so I'm, this is, seems to be more of a kind of a, a longer term structural call, mm -hmm. not not really fussed with today's supply demand dynamics. Because I mean, the, I'm looking at the sector both in Canada and the U.S. trading at a PE less than 10 times. Mm -hmm. These companies are gushing cash flow. Most of them are returning that all back to shareholders, mm -hmm. at, which is nice at $80. But if you think it's going to 55, I guess the economics don't work as well. Yeah, and if you specifically look at how we model out the energy companies, we actually use you know the current strip price for the next two years in our model. So we are capturing those currently high prices. But again, you know, thinking about where oil prices are going to be going, you know, not just this year and next year, but you know, five years, seven years, you know, ten years, you know, into the future, yeah, you know, we do expect that the cash flows of those companies will come down, you know, quite significantly over time. I, but I guess it takes a lot of time for these businesses to diversify and look to other areas, which they are doing. Mm -hmm. I'm just questioning that, you know, if you are putting in that long term view, in the meantime, there's still some money to be made. Well, again, you know, you just have to be, you know, very careful. The valuations, you know, on other different types of metrics, you know, for some of these companies, you know, is, is very high. Uh, one that I know that we think is, you know, significantly overvalued right now is Hess. So mm -hmm. Hess, I think, trades at about nine times, you know, EBITDA. Again, we think, you know, they're very well positioned. They have great assets. The net asset value of their, you know, different production facilities is very high. But it's just being priced, you know, way too high compared to, you know, the rest of the market. You know, we think it should probably trade at seven times EBITDA, which is still a premium over most of its competitors, you know, which are near six times.